Well, good morning. I hope it is not an unlucky coincidence, but this is my 13th university convocation speech as chancellor. I'm not by nature superstitious, but just for a moment I considered whether it would make sense, as many developers do, by eliminating floor, floor 13 from the elevators in high-rise buildings. If I followed that practice, this would be my 14th State of the University Address. But if I did that, you might think I was delivering you fake news or <laughs> alternative facts. So as the title of my re remarks suggests, we'll stick with 13. And as we look back on the successes of last year and as we look ahead for next year, I think we have many reasons to believe that we will have a very good year. My optimism is based upon a review of the titles of some of my conv convocation remarks from years past, particularly during the depths of the recession. In 2009, my remarks were entitled, When You're Going Through Hell, Don't Stop. And in 2010, I talked about the importance of strategy in stormy times. This year, though, we have many reasons to be optimistic. Last year, we celebrated a record enrollment of 28,700, and we have reason to believe that we will approach 29,000 or maybe even beyond this fall. And I want to commend the staffs in enrollment management and admissions and in the graduate school for ensuring that we had a successful uh, academic recruiting year. Last year, we enjoyed a very good budget passed by the General Assembly, and for reasons I will detail in a moment, we know that the budget for 2017-18 will be quite solid, and it will continue to allow us to hire new faculty and staff and to continue to strengthen and expand our inventory of academic programs. Last year, our faculty uh, continued their excellent work in instruction, in research and creative activity, and in service to the community, as Joan mentioned. And we had sponsored awards topping 50 million for the first time, actually almost 51. Not only exceeding the previous year's title, but uh, actually that, that uh, sum is 80% greater than we had five years ago in terms of externally sponsored awards. Individual and institutional recognitions continue to pour in for our faculty and staff. Several members of the faculty, including Murray Webster, were recognized for career achievements from their respective professional associations. With our recent institutional recognition by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities as an innovation and prosperity university, we, come, we become one of only 39 institutions, uh, public institutions, that have that designation, and there are about 196 public research universities. We're only one of 39 institutions of that 196 to hold that designation simultaneously with being a Carnegie Foundation community-engaged university. Recognitions for our students uh, and our alumni also continue to come in. And many of our students excelled not just in the classroom, but in other ways. We saw Larry Ogunjobi become the first UNC Charlotte faculty, uh, excuse me, football player. <laughs> He'll be back. Um, <laughs> to be drafted into the National Football League, while three other UNC Charlotte students were signed as free agents in the NFL. Three of these four players go into the pros with their college degrees already in hand. And as we uh, move into this next academic year, we will be able to draw, as we said, upon the enthusiasm and the great new ideas of newcomers to the faculty and staff, many of whom are here today. And you can see in that list of them, uh, they're coming from all over the country and all over the world. We have nine continuing members of our Board of Trustees, led by our chair, Joe Price. He'll be joined by our new SGA president, Tracy Allsbrook, who you met this morning and by newcomers and alumni, uh, Dennis Bunker, Brett Keeter, and T. Ross Young. When I became chancellor in 2005, we had only one alumnus serving on our board of trustees, which has 12 appointed members. We will now have eight alumni, alumni on our board of trustees. Our senior administration will be strengthened with newcomers Kevin Bailey as the vice chancellor for student affairs, Fatma Mealy as dean of the College of Computing and Informatics, Mike Mazzola as the Executive Director of the Energy Production and Infrastructure Center, Jennifer Walker as Director of Internal Audit, and Sally, Sally Hutton Sistar as Executive Director of Alumni Affairs. With respect to the campus-wide administration, July 1 marked the beginning of the new Division of Institutional Integrity, 
which combines the functions of legal affairs, internal audit, ethics and compliance, enterprise risk management, and Title IX. And Vice Chancellor and General Counsel Jesh Humphrey leads that new division. This is a unique organizational structure within the UNC system. It represents the best thinking we have done about how to anticipate, respond to, and mitigate the many risks that universities face today in the complex world of higher education. Or to put it more simply, within the Cato building, I have surrounded myself, uh, myself with people who, who can best protect me from getting fired or going to jail. <laughs> now, thanks to the work of President Margaret Spellings and her talented government relations staff, along with our own Betty Doster, my special assistant for constituent relations, we start the year with an outstanding budget that included full funding for our enrollment growth and no permanent budgetary reductions, as we have seen nearly every year since I've been the chancellor. An additional $50 million in one-time funding for repairs and renovations uh, was also approved by the Board of Governors, uh, was also approved by the General Assembly. The Board of Governors will determine how much each campus will receive. The General Assembly also provided at least some salary increase funding for both EHRA and SHRA employees. Uh, to put the General Assembly's salary actions in some context, we have to remember that since 2010, in the depth of the Great Recession, no salary increases whatever were voted by the General Assembly in five of the fiscal years from 2010 to 2016. The increases approved for this year represent the second year in a row that we have seen salary adjustments, although they may not be what we feel we need or what we think we deserve. For that reason, of course, we will continue to look for opportunities to make campus-based strategic salary adjustments for employees as our resources permit. And as I've said all year, this is the year when we will make a strategic salary adjustment for our full-time faculty, and I have set aside funds from our enroll enrollment increase dollars for that purpose. The funding received for enrollment increases at UNC Charlotte permits us to continue to expand our investment in new academic programs as well, to serve the educational needs of the greater Charlotte region, one of the fastest, fastest growing areas in the country. This last year, we were able to add important program choices for undergraduate students interested in healthcare with a bachelor's program in health systems management. At the graduate level, we made additional investments in our data science initiative, secured approval for new master's programs in cybersecurity, in management, and in respiratory care, and have moved forward proposals for master's, program, master's programs in architecture, in athletic training, and for a doctoral program in civil engineering. This year, we will be examining more closely the idea of adding bachelor's and doctoral programs in data science. And we've also begun a conversation with the University of North Carolina School of Law in Chapel Hill, but some kind of joint programming in, in, at the graduate level and in, in certificates in legal studies. Uh, we do not envision creating another law school in the state. Uh, there is simply no market at the present time for stu students who hold the JD degree. But we do think there may be a need for graduate level programming, both degree and certificate, in legal studies for people who work in government, human resources, or in compliance related positions in highly regulated institutions. And we have several of them in this community in fields like energy, financial services, and in healthcare. At the opposite end of the educational continuum, continuum we will use this year to advance some important initiatives related to pre-college education. Our existing uh, Charlotte Engineering Early College, which we call SEEK, will enter its fourth year with larger numbers of 11th grade students and 12th grade students taking regular university level coursework as they complete their high school education. Remarkably, last year, 75 students in the 11th grade completed an average of 16 college credit hours with an average grade point average of 3.2 in regular university courses. That's a stunning result when you consider the fact that the student body for that school was not cherry picked by the university, but selected by a random lottery process run by CMS for its magnet schools. The composition of that school closely resembles the composition of CMS at large. 67% of the students are ethnic minorities, 48% come from economically disadvantaged families, 
50% are first-generation college students. We thank the faculty especially for welcoming these young students onto our campus and into their classrooms. Now we hope to dip, duplicate this success with the Charlotte Teachers Early College, which we call CTEC, a joint initiative of CMS and the Cato College of Education. Uh, Dean Ellen McIntyre and her colleagues have already welcomed about 50 ninth graders who think they might have a long-term career interest in teaching. For those, who, of, those of you who work or in and around the education building, if you begin to think that the students are getting younger and younger, <laughs> uh, your mind will not be playing tricks on you. And as far as we know, this model for engaging, the, enlarging the pipeline for new teachers has never been attempted in this country. So we know it is an absolutely essential experiment to see if we can build back up the teacher preparation programs that have seen such serious decline in North Carolina and in the country. Our long-term objective is to actually raise sufficient private funding and then seek a state match to build a permanent facility for both schools on this campus. Our other uh, pre-college initiatives flow directly from the civil unrest of last year that occurred in University City. As a result of a police-involved shooting of Keith Lamont Scott and the recent report of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Economic Opportunity Task Force. Joan has spoken already about some of this. Uh, what I can tell you additionally is that we've asked each of our academic colleges to think about, first of all, to read that report and think about how their work may intersect with the report's recommendations, particularly those relating to college and career readiness. We will assess those ideas over the course of the fall semester. Let me mention that uh, the featured speakers at this year's annual Ber Dr. Ber Bertha Maxwell Roddy Distinguished Af Afghana Studies Lecture are the co-chairs of the Economic Opportunity Task Force Report, Dr. Ophelia Garman Brown and Mr. D. Odell. They are coming to this campus on the anniversary of the shooting, September 20th. They'll be at McKnight Hall here uh, at 5.30 p.m. to talk about the report and how the university can best contribute to improving the lives and opportunities of all of our citizens. I hope you could join us at that event. No annual report from me would be uh, complete without a reference to our ongoing program of capital construction and renovation uh, with more than $1.2 billion invested since 2005. This year will be no different as we have already started construction on the Health and Wellness Center next door to the Student Union. We've started the expansion of the Student Union parking lot and uh, parking deck, and the Undergraduate Admissions Center will break ground later this year in South Village. Major renovation projects include the Denny Building and the other academic facilities in the campus core, our older student residence halls, and the old residence dining hall. And next month, we will begin renovation of Belk Plaza, where the Belk Tower once stood, with the goal of finishing phase one of that project uh, by spring. Design continues on our new science building, which was approved by the voters uh, in the state bond measure in 2006, excuse me, the spring of 2016. Construction is scheduled to begin in September of 2018 with completion and move in two years thereafter. I know you will be glad to know that the dodging orange uh, construction cones and dump trucks uh, will continue to be part of campus life for the foreseeable future. Uh, but I will share with you that this is going to be a particularly challenging year with the construction of the Health and Wellness Center, the expansion of the Union Parking Deck, and the creation of Belk Plaza. When the deck expansion is uh, completed in May of this next year, we will enjoy a net gain of more than 200 parking spaces in that very busy part of campus. But until then, many folks are going to have to park in one of our more distant parking structures and use the newly enhanced shuttle system. So be prepared for the challenges, and if you can uh, do so, plan ahead and try to avoid the morning and afternoon rush hours. I want to acknowledge that the rise of campus enrollment over the past decade and the continuing adverse impacts that go along with the lots of construction and renovation have obviously generated a certain level of uh, frustration for members of the campus community at one time or another. Uh, last year I appointed a task force led by the then Associate Dean of the Belt College of Business, Richard Buttimer, 
to review the causes of campus congestion and submit recommendations for consideration. They made 34 wide-ranging recommendations, um, including possible changes in our physical infrastructure uh, and our parking system, enhance uh, alternative modes of transportation, and changes to campus operations. I won't address all of those recommendations here this morning. I would ask you that if you're interested, go on the Chancellor's website in, in the Chancellor's outbox, and there's not only a copy of the report, but a sort of a progress report on where things stand. Uh, but there is one change, one recommendation that I have accepted that will have broad consequences for faculty, students, and staff related to the basic design of our class schedule which was altered about a decade ago to focus on having more classes offered twice a week. Our current schedule was designed to accommodate the growth of our physical plant and to allow more time for travel between the far-flung classes on our campus. And as a result of the changes we adopted at that time, Fridays are markedly less crowded. Quite apart from the issues of congestion, we know that our ability to offer a sufficient number of classes for our growing student body and to document for state decision makers that we're making maximum efficient use of our facilities. Uh, those things are challenged when you try to do in four days what you could do in five. Now I don't expect that this decision is going to stop people from waving, me as I cross, waving to me as I cross the campus, but I'm sure that it may cause some to not wa wave with all their fingers. Um, <laughs> E even so, effective with the fall semester of 2018, one year from now, we'll move back to a schedule that includes a more robust set of offerings on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, including the use of 50-minute classes from 8 a.m. to 2.15 p.m. Um, faculty members who want to continue to offer one hour and 15-minute classes that you typically see on, on Tuesdays and Thursdays can do so on Monday, Wednesdays, and Friday, any two-day combination of that, beginning at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon or later. And we know this is gonna cause some hardship, so Provost Lorden is going to appoint a small group of staff and faculty to develop some implementation details. Again, we have a year to get ready for this. Uh, if you wanna go and review the task force recommendations, you can find those um, on the website, as I mentioned. Many of the recommendations are not going to be implemented right away until we get a good sense of how traffic patterns on campus are altered by the arrival of, late, of light rail. And um, in that um, connection, you'll notice that we're all running on our campus our own branded um, uh, shuttle system called Niner Transit. Um, the advantage, I think, for us is not only, I'll mention in a moment, some of the specific advantages, but no longer do we have to put up with powder blue cats buses carrying advertisements for Queens University and Strayer University. <laughs> now, uh, what will be most different about Niner Transit is the scheduling, enhanced to make sure that we have a shuttle waiting to move folks getting off the light rail trains. And the light rail trains during peak hours will be arriving every seven to 10 minutes. Uh, with trains arriving 103 times every day, and departing that many times, we cannot realize the benefits of light rail unless we have an efficient shuttle system. So, uh, and again, if you don't want to wait for the shuttle system or you have somewhere else to go on campus, we hope you'll avail yourselves of the new bike share program, which is already on campus called Charlotte Wheels. Uh, we've started with 100 bicycles at 10 locations across the campus, and they are virtually free to use. We certainly hope the faculty and st staff and students will take advantage of light rail. Uh, as of today, CATS is telling us that the light rail line will be open either in late fall, uh, I would bet early spring. Uh, but starting in the spring semester, every student will be charged a $50 annual fee with unlimited rides on light rail. Uh, that includes transfers to and from any CATS public transportation, including any CATS bus, any express route bus, and the CATS airport shuttles. Faculty and staff will also have the option of purchasing an unlimited all-access pass for $75. In, in all cases, your UNC Charlotte ID will hold the transportation app that you'll simply go to the station, tap it on the actuator, and get on the train without having to buy a ticket. Turning to another topic, uh, the upcoming 2017 uh, year will be an, a pivotal year for Exponential, the campaign for UNC Charlotte. 
the largest private fundraising campaign in our history. With just three years remaining on that campaign, we need to push toward our goal of 200 million, knowing that we've already raised 140 million of that to date. This year's efforts are gonna be focused on securing gifts and pledges from faculty and staff, including our retirees. Uh, Professor Jeffrey Leak of the Department of English has agreed to chair an energetic group of faculty and staff, including some retirees, uh, to lead that campaign. I'm proud to tell you that as of today, faculty and staff has all, have already committed $8.6 million to that campaign, but we need to do more. Each among us, of course, needs to decide whether they will participate in the campaign and at what level. Any gift pledged can be paid out over time and via payroll deduction. I certainly understand there are some folks who may not want to participate. They may not want to give anything. They feel like they've given every day at the office uh, or their salary doesn't reflect their hard work and dedication to this institution. I get that. With that said, if you're approached by Jeffrey or any one of his committee members and you're tempted to utter the words, over my dead body, please be assured that we can handle estate gifts. <laughs> so let me conclude with some observations about campus life last year and what we might expect in the upcoming year. There's no question that local and national issues last year impacted the campus whether we are talking about the civil unrest and protest activity in Charlotte that followed the shootings, the shooting of Mr. Scott, or local reaction to the debate over national policies related to immigration and national security. Our approach to last year will be our approach to this year, fully committed to a campus culture where our differences are celebrated as part of a vigorous intellectual community dedicated to academic freedom, robust debate, and mutual respect. We will not condone violence, but we must support both peaceful, peaceful protest on the one hand and the rights of individuals to say or do things that some might find offensive, objectionable, or hurtful on the other. As an academic community, we must stand behind the power of education. When a student decided last year to post a Nazi flag that could be seen through his residence hall windows, we use that incident as an opportunity both to protect his free speech rights as provided by the United States Supreme Court, but also to have a conversation with that young man to help him fully understand the true impact of deploying a symbol that embraced a history of hatred and genocide. His voluntary decision to remove that flag spoke volumes about the power of an educational opportunity when exercised at the right time. We will also work to clarify expectations within the campus community about how we will respond to incidents or actions on campus that run counter to our campus values. For those of you who have known me over the years that I've served in this job, you know I will never advocate for administrative policies or practices that inhibit free and transparent discourse. To paraphrase Justice Lewis Brandeis, the best way to respond to speech containing ideas that we find objectionable is more speech expressing the ideals we cherish. With that said, we reserve the prerogative to condemn in a public way any behavior or any expression of speech that runs counsel counter to our statement of university vision and values. That would certainly include the deplor deplorable actions of white supremacist groups in Charlottesville this past weekend who incited violence in the name of hate, religious bigotry, and racism. And of course, we reserve the right to take appropriate disciplinary actions in those rare cases, I hope, when speech is used in a, such a way that it conveys no constitutionally protected idea, provokes or encourages violence, or constitutes a face-to-face -face and threatening verbal assault of one person upon another. As I mentioned in the outset of my remarks, I remain truly optimistic about our future together and the continuation of an affirming campus culture that for many decades has embraced the productive discussion of ideas, collaboration, and collegiality. And it is in that spirit that I thank you for your attention this morning. So let me close with one final philosophical thought. Existentialism is a concept centered upon the analysis of existence 
and the way humans find themselves existing in the world. And I'll demonstrate this for you. Uh, three gentlemen pass away suddenly on the same day, and they meet up at the orientation session in heaven. The celestial facilitator asks them what would they most like to hear said about themselves as their friends and relatives are passing by their caskets at their upcoming funerals. Well, the first man says, I, I sure hope people will say that I was a wonderful doctor and a fine family man. And the second man says, well, I would like people to say that I was a school teacher. I made a huge difference in the lives of children. And the third man thinks about this for a second and he says, well, I would most like to hear someone say, my gosh, he's moving. Uh, <laughs> So thank you very much. We are going to take about a five minute break to reset the stage for the uh, general meeting of the faculty. Thank you very much.